On the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. Hello, everyone. This week's episode, we are sharing a YouTube live that we did with Dr. Shiloh and Dr. Scott from the LA Not So Confidential podcast. When we recorded this, we had not had the pleasure of meeting them in person, but only a week later was CrimeCon London and we got to sit down with them, have a drink, share some stories. And let me tell you, we will definitely be doing another crossover episode with them in the future. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, we hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, everyone. So we have the host of Stop the Killing on today. And Stop the Killing is a fantastic podcast that I talked about in an episode pretty recently when Scott and I were talking about what we listened to. But this podcast began in 2021 as this deep dive into the mass shootings and the case files of the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And so in the pink, we want to welcome Sarah Ferris. Hi, Sarah. Uh, She is an award-winning true crime podcaster based out of the UK, known for such shows such as Conning the Con, Clueless, Guilty Greeny. I need to know if it's sunny in London because it's been nothing but rainy and drizzly in LA. And I'm like, if I have to go to London to get some sunshine, that's weird, but I'm leaving next Friday. So... (laughs) You'll be very pleased to know that it is super sunny, but the sad thing is, is I'm sitting inside and I have been all afternoon recording with Catherine and not enjoying it. Oh Um, my God. It's irrelevant, really. Catherine, how could you? (laughs) I know. I should have known better. I should have known better. You got like, this already speaks to me about how efficient you guys are that you've been recording and then you had this and you just lined it all up. (laughs) It sounds efficient, but don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Oh, I I We can relate. Yeah. Yeah, and we're in the same city. You guys aren't even in the same country. So I can imagine the effort and appreciate the effort. But let me introduce Catherine. So Catherine Schweit is an accomplished author, attorney, podcaster as well now, and former FBI special agent. She's the author of the book, Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Crisis. As an adjunct professor at DePaul University and Webster University, she teaches courses in law and policy. And she's a member of various organizations, including she's a fellow ATAP member to Scott and I, which is the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. Of course, our audience is somewhat familiar, I think, at this point, and is a recognized expert in crisis response, workplace violence, and corporate security policies. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. That's a lot of words. That's very (laughs) kind of you to say all those words. Oh, you haven't got any more time because you've just ended up telling everybody Catherine's entire career. It's quite well, the career, isn't it? it? It really is. And every time, you know, you federal agents really know how to have multiple careers in a lifetime. And Scott and I feel like we've done that as well. And I had to cut that paragraph down. So you guys, there's a lot more where that came from. Yeah. <laughs> Well, welcome. We are so thrilled to have discovered your podcast and also so thrilled that we're going to get to hang out with you guys in a few weeks. And I'm very um, excited about that. Yeah. Catherine, did you do CrimeCon in London last year? I did not. I was out in Las Vegas for CrimeCon my okay. first time. Yeah, but I, didn't, was, I haven't that been was to, my first time. Yeah, and I haven't been to London, so I'm going to be very, I'm so excited to come to London. I'm leaving Thursday night. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I will be out there on Friday. So, Mm -hmm. and then Scott's joining us right before. So we are, we're taking some long overdue vacations and making it one big extended vacation. (laughs) Well, let's get into it. Yeah. 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 Sarah, you know, most of your previous podcast episodes have to do with con artist stories and How did you make this hard turn into mass casualty events as a topic to explore? By everything in my life at the moment is just accident, really, I think. So, you know, I wasn't a podcaster before. My first podcast was just such a crazy story that it had to be told. So Mm -hmm. I discovered how to tell the story through the podcast medium. And that was a personal story about my little sister who swiped right on a serial con man. Mm -hmm. And after... 
that podcast, I happened to be invited onto a platform, an audio platform that was for creators of podcasts and just really interesting people. And when that happened, we had this Zoom meeting and everybody had to go around the room and, and sort of introduce themselves and say what they had done to end up on this, you know, special beta testing of a platform. Felt all very, you know, behind the velvet road. <laughs> right. And I didn't know anything. I mean, it's a complete <laughs> muppet and new to this situation. So I was just sitting on my bed thinking I wouldn't have had to put the, you know, webcam on. Not the case. And we're going around and I kind of go, oh, you know, they ask the question of, so what have you done? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm a complete imposter. I don't even know how I ended up here. And then the next person kind of goes around and says, oh, I've done radio and TV and blah, blah, blah. And these are people who say, I've had, oh, oh I have 3,000 episodes on my podcast. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> exactly. And I'm just sitting there super intimidated on my bed going, how the heck am I in this situation? And it gets to lovely Catherine. And she says to, at the beginning, she goes, well, Sarah, I can relate because I'm an imposter too. And I'm like, thank God. This Love it. Cool. You know? Yeah. And then she goes on to say, I'm the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And I'm like, well, one, she doesn't know what an imposter is. <laughs> and two, we're clearly going to have to connect. And, and that's kind of how it happened. I just sort of reached that's, out. That'd be when I'd be like on camera, like brushing the Cheetos dust off my shirt. Like, <laughs> right. oh, I guess I must have to, I'm going to have to up my game here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, she's on to me. But yeah. So anyway, after that, I just said, do you want to do an interview on this new platform? And she was kind enough to ignore me for about three weeks until I stalked her on Twitter. And when we did connect, we kind of went, she said, I need to do a podcast. I'm like, hey, oh my uh, gosh, join me. Yeah. Uh, the platform had somebody, I had been on a couple of podcasts and because my subject is a little complicated sometimes. And so this platform was looking for podcasters and someone on there had kind of stalked me and said, you should do a podcast. And I was saying, no, I can't do a podcast. I don't have time to do a podcast. I can't do a podcast. I don't have time to do a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so that was the whole story. And then I saw Sarah and she's like, oh, I'm an imposter. I'm like, honey, you've done a podcast. I don't even have that. So <laughs> I'm like, you can't that, tell me you're an imposter. So I, have no, I had no, no experience except for being on podcasts and on other things. That is a great segue to my question for you then. I mean, certainly Dr. Shiloh and I have the same, almost exactly the same experience and we're still straddling the worlds because we're still working full time. For you, you know, having transitioned out of your position at the FBI, we know it's hard to cross that barrier from professional to media platform, but what was it like actually for you to do the show and once you got over, okay, I guess I'm going to be doing this. You know, how did you find yourself? Which in that happened place? about season three. I just want to <laughs> very recently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Your, your question, sir. Well, no, what happened like, when so, you? Yeah. Like what? I, so you say it took you a while to kind of get in the groove, but you were probably already in the groove as far as the audience was concerned, right? That, how did you guys work out all the logistics to make this happen? And what like the formula is for your show, really? And if exactly. that's changed, if that's evolved over time. Well, Sarah can probably give you the best description of the show and the formula because <laughs> she's she's juggling a bunch of podcasts and I just have my little podcast. But for little me. Little podcast. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, what happened is I had left when I left the FBI, it's because the FBI kicks agents out at a certain age and it's mandatory. So you have to go. Mm -hmm. And so I left, I went into private industry and I realized that all the work that I had done running the FBI's program ab about these active shooters, these mass shootings was really still, they were really still struggling out in business and industry and schools trying to figure out what to do. And I was constantly being called for interviews on podcasts and you know I do an hour here and an hour there and on interviews during the news segments and a shooting would happen and I'd call can you can you get on and explain what's going on and explain what the police should be doing and what should civilians be doing and that was a constant thing so I was writing another book at the time that I was really enjoying and my book agent said to me you can't get the book done because you are spending too much time on all this <laughs> other stuff so you need to get all that stuff out of your head. So just write a book about all that stuff. And then people will stop calling you for that. 
ha 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 yeah <laughs> which was a complete fail yeah i guess <laughs> that didn't happen yeah that's just happen. gonna make more people call you so i did write a book stop the killing how to end the mass shooting crisis and that was released last year and actually just a couple of weeks ago, I released the second edition, which I'm really happy about because it's a soft cover book. And so it's cheaper. My original publisher had published it in a hard copy, and which is great, but makes it more expensive, right? So, so I did that. And then, and it was around the time that I was working on the book and coming out with the book that Sarah and I had this connection. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I think naively, oh, maybe this is a better way to manage my time and that worked out so well. So, yeah. Oh, so well. And How's actually, your Saturday going? <laughs> I will say yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. It's 75 outside and sunny oh, here. And I'm gosh. inside on a Saturday. But I will say this. You know what Sarah said before? As Sarah has said previously, which I think is really spot on. She's the target market for this podcast. People who are parents, people who work, and they're worried. Their worry is over-occupying their mind. And instead of enjoying a Saturday or instead of enjoying their visit to the mall or to the movie theater or to church or they're letting their kids safely go to school, they just feel like around every corner is some mass shooter. And that's really not true. The numbers don't bear that out. But that's kind of part of what we talk about is replacing, you know, fear with facts. Well, I can tell you that from the people who've started listening, because I mentioned your show like I said in a few of our episodes ago, that I had I have a friend that binged the entire thing. I'm like, I'm not even done with it. How did you binge all of it? Like, wow, what are you doing? Wow. And she's like, and then wow. I listened to Catherine's book. But she said, you know, wow. what it did for me is it brought me hope and it made me less scared. Yeah. And I was like, I know. And I thought, yes, 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 yes. Because you know, when, when Scott and I are diving into the research on this, or we go to an ATAP conference and it's just like, it is less scary, the more facts, you know, and not everybody has access to all of that. And mm -hmm. um, sure. it, it is so deeply emotional as a parent. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think for those of us who have worked in and around law enforcement, you know, you're around it and you have these facts all the time. So it could also go the other way where you are now sort of blowing this up into it's just around the corner, right? One yes. of our one of our default cognitive distortions, of course, that I'm trying to undo all the time with now my clients working in a clinical. But I think whatever your formula is and whatever your vision was really has has made that goal. So oh, thank you. Oh, um, I and I and I know for me, you know, it it, it felt like it, it's almost like, you know, you're your co-host on this, Catherine, but you're just taking all of these interviews that you've done and you're like now the professional interviewee slash podcast host with it. I don't want to be. <laughs> well, it's it, it's working. It's working. Well, so. I'll say, you know, one of the things that you mentioned about the ATEP conferences, you know, you're you're working in a particular area. And I think that I'm a generalist in some ways. Right. Expert at none. Right. And and so the the value in that is that. I'm so from, I mean, I've been at these shooting scenes. I've been at the locations. I've talked to the people before. I've talked to the people afterwards. So, so really I'm able to say, well, th these are great things that happened before that help this community. Even just, I was just a Friday having lunch with the Michigan State University police chief. He had a shooting at his school, mm -hmm. eight students shot, three of them killed. And they had... 10 years ago, brought their 911 centers together for that whole community in Ingham County. And because of that, instead of having two 911 operators on at 10 o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night, they had 12 on and eight more who showed up, who took the 2,400 calls and yeah. text messages that they got, which, which is work that was done ahead of time, having no idea how valuable that would be down the road, mm -hmm. but it was. And I think I have that broad perspective. And I think that helps to maybe sometimes for me to key in on particular things that audience members might bring up or, you know, yes. pay, you know, people uh, might bring up where you guys are really experts in your field, but maybe don't know as much about law enforcement, you know, response yeah. on a particular thing. Absolutely. I just, a. Uh anecdotal story for myself as a parent, my child is starting a new school and 
they've been so lovely. They scheduled a meeting with my husband and I this week because when, uh, technically they were interviewing us. But of course, when they asked, like, do you have any questions during that process? My question to them was, what is your threat assessment protocol? And yes. uh, oh, nice. which, which I had had in my head, security has always been very important to us. But I didn't love their answer. I'll say that for, for a crisis situation, they have some great things in place. But we had this follow-up call this week. And so a question that I asked, which I think I've heard from Catherine on one of the episodes, they were talking about their camera system. And I said, but can you access that off campus? <laughs> And I have yeah. uh, Catherine's voice in my head. I think for parents knowing, you know, they might not be as super gung ho as I would be, but to ask some of those questions, because even to if, be curious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I so told true. them like, you know, if you've thought about this a million times, forgive me, but I just need to hear it. And that's every parent has that right. So yeah, no, and no parent should ever feel bad about asking yeah. about something that involves their safety or the safety of their child. When your kid goes to play at somebody's house, you shouldn't hesitate to ask that that parent, you know, hey, do you have guns in the house? Yeah. Or how are they locked up? Absolutely. It's, you know, there's nothing I, wrong with that, but we're we're always so polite. Well, and I, I know that that's probably a weird question for parents to ask. So I always tell them, because we do have guns in our home and we're, my husband's still active law enforcement, that Yes, we have guns here, but they're all locked up because I know I want to ease their mind. Sarah, how have you sort of experienced this evolution in true crime podcasting where more subject matter experts and professionals are starting to enter the space, either to have their own shows or sort of co-host? Do you feel like the audience is hungry for some of that? And how do you think that's evolving? No, I think the brilliance of podcasts is the accessibility you get to people like Catherine and yourselves. Because I I mean, even with Stop the Killing, when you say, you know, kind of how did we come up with the formula? Part of it was me being listener number one and being a conduit for the audience and asking the questions that people that aren't in law enforcement or aren't professionals are thinking. And it's just so amazing. I pinch myself all the time when I'm having these conversations with Catherine and the amazing guests that she gets on to the podcast, you know, that accessibility is in everybody's ears at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it's a great thing, you know, and I don't think that means that it pushes out other, you know, the indie podcasters, there's space for everybody. And it's just about finding what your story is to tell. And I mean, I use on all of my podcasts, I've had professionals come in. So on Conning the Con, We had a psychologist that came through and ran through all of that kind of the red flags of con artists. And then on Clueless, the long con, which is another conning story, which is again about my family, very unfortunate connection there, but you know, don't get too close to me is the clue there. (laughs) But you know, and you'll meet this, the forensic psychiatrist that I brought on board for that because he will be coming to crime con in London. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it just adds an extra dimension. Yeah. Yeah, I think access is key for sure because not everyone can have access. I mean, they can't have access to necessarily the the trainings perhaps mm-hmm. and not everyone wants to sit down with a book where, you know, that's right. my bookshelf might be Stop the Killing, Trigger Points and The Violence Project, but that's not everybody's and they don't want to read all of that. <laughs> so, no. I mean, there's yeah. also, you know, our experience, we have such, I, I mean, I'm so impressed by the people that subscribe to us and listen to us, but it's interesting some of the the experiences we have where Shiloh and I will go down the rabbit hole to Wonderland in sort of our own psych research issues, and what you know listeners will go ugh too academic, and we'll go oh no, that's no you know what that's a valid point we were getting into research that really kind of gets us stimulated with stats and ratios and that turn some people off. So, you, you know, for us, we kind of are trying to straddle two different worlds. And it's interesting to see how your audience members react to what you put out there. Well, you two are both in the same field, whereas I've got Catherine and she has to speak like, you know, true crime for dummies to me. So uh-huh. it's very accessible in that respect, isn't it? True crime for Muppet. <laughs> I was just, I was just going to, Sarah, I don't think of you as a Muppet most of the wow. time. Most of the time. 
Um, I'm I was just going to piggy a little bit. To be but fair, it's but very anyway. cute. You're very cute, as you always are. I was just going to say that when you know we were looking at a formula of what we thought would be appealing, certainly as Sarah mentioned, you know we we both have different positions that we come from, but we wanted to um, kind of create a, a format style mm -hmm. so that each episode you'd kind of know where you were going and where you were coming from, and we didn't want to lose track of the idea that we started from the very beginning, which is let's look at an incident and then say what occurred, what occurred before the incident, and what might have maybe potentially, now that we talk about the subject, what might have been there to, to be seen by others or heard by others. And, and with the idea that, hey, if you have this ability to see and hear things around you, which we all do, you know, here's what, then what you need to do with it. Right. So yeah. not 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 focusing on the shooters, but definitely telling the story of the shootings and the victims. And because of that, as Sarah mentioned, we've been able to, you know, tap every, you know, I, I'm constantly calling friends of mine and saying, hey, do you have a spare half an hour? Hey, do you have a spare? You know, and that's that's the the Frank DeAngelis, you know, who wrote yeah. the forward to my book, who is the who is the principal at Columbine High School. Yeah. But, you know, just different people from different areas, whether they're behavioral experts whether they're police officers, whether they're school principals, whether they're researchers. Yeah. Well, it's 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 starting to fold in the real people that have lived this, that have also studied it, that have responded to it. And that's that that extra layer, because as Scott and I know, like your, your podcast does have to have some sort of evolution. And, you know, it's just been really yeah. it's been really cool to listen to Sarah, like you as the student, like things click that you're like, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what to pick out in this one. <laughs> that's, I got it. But that's what your audience is doing too. Hopefully. Yeah. And taking into real life. Hope I am so. a slow learner though, aren't I, Catherine? We've just finished recording and I, I said something about, I don't know, do you think that person snapped? And I literally could see oh, her oh, just reach oh. down the Zoom and snap, like whack me on the hand. That's our pet peeve but, too. Yeah. Yeah. But that was good because, you know what, we did have a, we did have a little, you know, five minutes of, you know, what does that really mean? And the kind of the trajectory uh -huh. and, you know, you wouldn't say somebody snapped if they punched somebody, if they were having an argument before and somebody had pushed somebody in the shoulder. Right. So it's a, a progressive effort and, mm. and that's just what it's like. So we had a fun discussion about that. One other Please. thing I would say about the podcast is that my, well, it had to have this because I'm very much a glass half full kind of person. We had to end on a on a high note as many times as we could with some oh, sure. stories of hope and heroism, and also something that people can take away to feel that they've got some control and power in the situation. Mm -hmm. So that's the driving force a little bit behind, not just entertainment as I like to call it. It's all no, about it's leaving something that gives people control. Yes, it's perfect to end each episode that way for sure. So, Catherine, can you tell us a little bit more about the formation of the FBI's active shooter program, how you became involved in that, and what do they do? Sure. So, you know, I was an agent with the FBI for 20 years, and an agent does what an agent is assigned. So I'm a national security agent for 15 years working counterterrorism and counterintelligence and espionage cases, and I'm working in Washington, D.C., in December of 2012, when the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting happens, and all those children are killed, not six women are killed in the building. But I will point out, I'm just going to say, because if we not, not close back to this, that children who were trained in active shooter training at Sandy Hook just a few months earlier, several children escaped the classroom because of their brave teacher. And those children are alive and adults today, bigger today, right? Because they knew they knew what to do. So don't think that training is useless. Mm -hmm. So the Sandy Hook shooting happened and President, President Obama assigned then President, Vice President Biden to create a task force of federal agencies and to get their heads out of their, you know, get their world together. And I was the FBI person, I think, because I was like walking down the hallway at a given moment as happens. And so I was voluntold, hey, can, can you do this? So I joined the White House team with these executives from other federal agencies who were trying to say, what's the problem and how can we fix it? Mm -hmm. And there were, we focused on, you know, kind of two areas. What's the problem for police and how can we fix it? What's the problem for civilians and how can we fix it? And you mean as far as police response? Mm -hmm. So the okay. police focused on police response. We created a different type of, 
we to, we create work through push out all across the country, the type of protocol that police have now to go to the shooter. I don't know, I had 30 million out of my budget, I know, that went to training police officers in their communities so they didn't have to travel, training them for free with our personnel who would travel to their departments and train them so that everybody was on the same page. So anybody who shows up at a shooting now should know exactly what to do and uh, all kind of have the same basic protocols. So that's fantastic. And then the other side of it was, you know, what should civilians do? And out of that came Run, Hide, Fight, developed originally by the city of Houston and other training. And we worked with other communities to develop, other federal agencies to develop community recommendations and best standards and practices, which is a lot of government gobbledygook. But what it means is we're all talking with one voice. We, we, we worked with a team of medical professionals to change the way that we think of tourniquets. And I grew up thinking a tourniquet would make your leg fall off. Now we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. And that now we say, do give tourniquets, do put tourniquets on people. You know, another team at the White House built, developed the Stop the Bleed program right. that's out there, which is just tourniquets, find a way to stop bleeding. That's good practice. You know, you can't use a Band-Aid on a, on a knife wound. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's been two or three incidents at the law enforcement agency where I work where the Stop the Bleed program has saved officers' lives from yeah, and, horrific car accidents to shootings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, one of the things that we did is we just, again, you know, when, when you've got the money in your budget, we just, we bought thousands of, I think I ordered 30,000 tourniquets yep. and, 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 and med kits for the, uh, for the agents. And then we just distributed them. And then we said, this is the standard practice. This is what all law enforcement should do if your department isn't doing this now, mm -hmm. buy tourniquets for your people. Mm -hmm. And we set that standard and we, and we use it as a hope that other departments will do the same. Yeah. And so was there a study on active shooter incidents that came out of that program? I think it was kind of inadvertent because when we started meeting with the federal agencies, the Department of Education executive basically said that the news media was was just inflating all of the drama about these shootings. Mm -hmm. They weren't on the increase and we should be spending more money on plenty of other things in schools, but none of it should be on on anything that has to do with potential shootings. And we didn't really have any data at the FBI and there wasn't really any solid data looking at actual police reports to see whether or not these shootings were increasing. So in fact, I dragged together kind of, I, I you know, borrowed a bunch of analysts and we started what turned out to be the FBI's annual reporting on active shooter incidents. Active shooter being somewhat like a mass shooting, but an active shooter is it a shooter actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a in a public area, in a con, in a con, in a place where there's a lot of population, as opposed to the majority of mass shootings which occur like in homes and in neighborhoods. But the ones that are out in public are the ones that we're so scared of. They're the smallest number of shootings, but they're the ones we're most scared of. So we put those we put those stats together. And when we did, we found that, in fact, like in the first seven year block, there was an average of six of these types of shootings a year. But okay. when we looked at the next seven years, there was an average of 16. Last year, there were 50 in the United States. The year before that, there were 62 using all the same numbers criteria, all the same methodology. So well, definitely they've been increasing. I love also sort of one of the recurring themes and a, a big statement you make in the book, which is just completely something I feel completely in line with is that we have to stop looking for single answers. We have to stop looking for simple, linear, band-aid, on a head wound answers and take a back step, look at how complex all of this is and interrelated. So can you give us an idea of with the numbers you were just talking about, how do these mass shootings and then specifically school shootings fit into this larger framework of firearms, deaths, and homicides in the U.S.? Yeah, I can. If you can stand the numbers, I've got, I can spit out so many numbers so fast. Well, okay. I'm going to love it. Like, a, okay. a, a, we'll take our audience <laughs> along with us. I mean, okay. I don't know if I'm going to love it, but we well, I think it's important to talk. I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you. I, I'm going to apologize ahead of time to the audience members who are not numbers people. I am a writer, so it was hard for me to pull all these numbers and keep them in my head. But just as an example, the latest CDC Center for Disease Control Prevention data that we have on firearms deaths in the United States, firearms related deaths in the United States is from 2020. So in 2020, because we are the federal government after all, in 2020, there were about 45,000 people killed firearms by firearms in the United States. Of those 45,000, about 25,000 
or suicides. So the largest number of deaths in the United States with firearms are suicides, which is why we talk a lot about lock your damn gun up. So 20,000 are suicides. Another 20,000, almost 20,000 are homicides. And 500 of those firearms deaths are children who are, are what they call unintentional shootings, children who find weapons, 500 a year, 600 people killed by police. Of those 500 a year that are, that are killed where children find a gun and kill somebody else, the accident, kind of like accidental shootings. Now I want to take that step away and look at what mass shootings are and what we think about mass shootings and active shooters. 45,000 people killed in a year, 25,000 suicides, 20,000 homicides, five or 600 police killings, unintentional shootings by individuals, less than 100 mass shooting victims. In the active shooter world, less than a couple hundred when it comes to all of mass shootings. Mm. So mass shootings and the ones, the shootings that make all the news and the shootings that people are most afraid of make up less than 1% by far of the shootings deaths in the United States. So where should we focus our attention on? And when you were saying how there isn't a single answer, imagine if I can't find a single answer to just the mass shootings. And if we're talking about all of firearms violence, right. then it does involve suicide prevention, locking guns up, gang and drug warfare in, in cities. People say, oh, those shootings all occur in cities. 80% of our population in the United States lives in an urban suburban area. Most of these types of shootings that we think about with schools occur in suburban areas. Okay, um, you're blowing my mind because I never conceptualized it like that. And I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that, but wow, that's, that's really, and that is not part of the narrative at all. Mm -hmm. That's really not at all in, in, in mentioned in media. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. So I, so that was, that was so frustrating. I feel like I started out trying to explain and my, as I said, my book agent said, just put all that in a book. So people will stop asking you. You can stop saying it aloud. So the same thing happened with guns. Right. So, so this Saturday, a week ago, I released this tiny little paperback called How to Talk About Guns with Anyone that has that kind of information in it. Mm -hmm. And will, it I'll says- I'll make room for that in my luggage for bringing home. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, great, I know. And it has in the back of it, it has one of my favorite ungrammatical chapters. It's called Not Gonna Happen, might happen. Mm. Well, and again, like that feeds into the fear is that, okay, now we know from the numbers that it's happening in more suburban areas. So that's that feeding that trope of like, hmm, can happen anywhere, can happen at this tiny little, now we have a private school, you know, which private schools really hadn't been targeted areas, but now- But they had been before. That's the yeah. thing is that people yeah. don't know that and they didn't see the stories on it, but- Private schools have been shot. Sure. There have been shootings at private schools before. But now no. we have national news media that covers everything every time. Right. And I'm not racking on the media. It's just you know, I worked yeah. in media. It's just different. And and that's they're covering stories that people want covered. Yeah. No, for sure. And so one of our listeners on here brought up that 2020 was a lockdown year. Uh, and I know data takes a long time to get and put out there and publish. Are you seeing what trends are since COVID in any significant way? 2017, 2018, 2019, 30 active shooters, the FBI called every year, 30, 30, 30, 17, 18, 19. 2020, that year racked with COVID, 40. Got it. Well, I mean, the the mental stress, the chronic Anxiety that we were all under, I'm sure, contributes. And even with the numbers you were talking about, we can sort of umbrella those back and forth because if we look at 25,000 suicides, we know the majority of these mass shooters are suicidal and that's part of their plan to die by suicide or right. die 30, by- 30 to 40%. And, and we did see a, a significant rise in homicides in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, although I will say from a per capita basis, the United States is, it's much safer than it was in the, yes. in the 70s. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's hard to see that long-term unless you know the numbers, but it's much safer or we have a lot less firearm violence than we used to. And it's, it's just, an, it's easier to proclaim the opposite of that. 
it's just sloppy and easier for so many people in this kind of discussion. But thank you for explaining that. By any chance, do you know within those numbers when you're talking about how many of those gun deaths could be specifically attributed to domestic violence or intimate partner violence events? Um, some estimates are as many as 45% for the homicides. Yeah. We, we mm. did an episode just sort of looking at that as, as the grievance or the precursor, and it's quite a bit. So there's another, another layer. That's Sarah and I come across that a lot, don't we, Sarah, with the, 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 yeah. that there's those conflicts that are kind of domestic-based. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So just kind of moving along, Sarah, as a non-American, <laughs> how has this podcast... And this is a safe space. You can be it open and honest space. with us. Oh, we have Let a very worldwide audience. Oh. Well, it's definitely been an evolution. I mean, I started the the whole interview off with the very first interview I did with Catherine was, why the heck do you just not get rid of all the blooming guns? Right. I mean, that's right. what we're looking at America going, come on, people. I mean, it, why not? But since then, you know, having done four seasons with Catherine, it's just really kind of gone on this journey of understanding that it's such... A, a different problem and yeah I mean my my image of America is right now I probably wouldn't send my son there to uni at the minute mm -hmm. if I'm being completely honest but let's stay here stay here but I love those things that have come out of it like that total tiny little sentence you said before that you'd probably didn't think too much about Catherine was that actually America is safer now than it was when it comes to gun violence. And I think the perception outside of the country is that it's not. So I love that I get to hear that stuff. And that has shaped my my understanding of, of such a complex country. And also just probably didn't realize, you know, genuinely the size and the differences in each state. Mm -hmm. So it's been yeah. a real, a real education, I think. And, you know, I'm coming over for Crime Con in oh, September. Man. So Orlando, Florida even. Show me what you got, America. We're not you know going. Bring, oh, bring some anti-frizz hair gel because you're going to be hitting some major humidity. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, that's not good for me. Oh, I mean, man. No. Even we were like, Orlando, I think we'll pass this year. We're just going to go to London. <laughs> oh, no. Why did you tell me this beforehand? It's probably too late to cancel. Oh, oh my goodness. Dear. Well, and it's funny that you say something like, I wouldn't send my kid to uni over here. Every time something in the news hits, I'm like, Time to move to New Zealand. Like, let me start oh, looking at those psychology jobs in New Zealand. I mean, I mean, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, you Sarah's know. in London, but, you know, she's from New Zealand. I know. So it's perfect, I know. right? I mean, that's her place, man. She was there for yep. a couple months, right? Not too long ago. Yeah. yeah. Over Christmas. It's a great Very place. Nice. Nice. I don't work for the tourism board, but, you know, you don't of, have to. <laughs> one amazing. of our Patreon members is a clinical psychologist in New Zealand, and we're always like, we're going to be asking for jobs. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. It's a, I probably know her. There's only three of them there. Oh, there you go. Probably. Oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> you all know each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Anything, my cousin. anything else, Sarah, that just as a student, that's been your biggest sort of takeaway from this journey with Catherine and the show so far? Probably the top of the list is that I'm clearly not using my life properly. I've had not made anywhere near as many careers as this lady has. And keep yeah. it jammed. <laughs> I've always absolutely astounded at what she manages to pack in. But probably the biggest takeaway, I think, for me is that we have power in our communities. And if we can actually m motivate people to be the eyes and ears instead of waiting for government in whatever country you're in to make those slow grinding changes, you know, that's where I feel the most powerful from what I've learned from Catherine is that actually it's taught me that I am I am part of the first line of defense in stopping any of these kinds of incidents. And it doesn't have to be mass shootings. It just has happened to be, you know, the angry guy at the street on the corner that I wouldn't have yeah. reported earlier that might go on then to key someone's car down the road. It's been an education in teaching me how to be a better citizen, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. More Ask tuned my neighbors and then probably connect. like me for walking. Yeah. <laughs> they don't. But. Yeah. Empowering, like Catherine was saying, not being afraid to ask those questions or yes. say something. And if it's a nothing, then it's a nothing. And someone exactly. will examine that and figure it out. Can I just add one thing too here? I I have an unexpected byproduct of this is that I have been working in this space for more than 10 years at a time when I saw 
six shootings a year that fit into the category. And now last year there were 60, right? Mm -hmm. The year before, and then 50 this past year. So I really had a, a, a kind of a sense of frustration that I, I was just a gong in, yeah. you know, in the wind and nobody was hearing it. And the podcast has given me, I think, that comfort that there are people listening. And, there, and every once in a while, we'll get some message from somebody who's a Patreon or they have an inquiry and they'll say, I did this or I found this or I heard this. And we all know that that's what it takes is that each individual. And so it's really helped me to to keep moving forward on this mission. Yeah, that's lovely. That That's the stuff you don't even think about when you start a show like this is those little anecdotal stories. And I like to think that there are a few brave souls that write in and do tell us that. And hopefully there's more doing it that we don't know about. <laughs> but yeah, that's really nice when you get that that feedback from folks of how you're impacting just their everyday regular lives mm -hmm. in a really important way. Actually, and one of the coolest things that ever happened, just because it was the ego filler, is I got a call from a guy on a plane once and he said, hi, I'm reading your book and I have this problem that's happened at my company and I need your advice on it. Oh. I was like, holy cow. You're like, yeah, you know, you, here's you, the number to my consulting you, business. You opened up their perspective to something that was problematic that they may have not even, you know, had yeah. an inkling of before. What yeah. a what a a huge paradigm shift for people as we yeah, it's very gratifying. Know, open our perspective mm -hmm. up. You know, Catherine, I wanted to say, you know, like I guess to put a maybe a, some bookends or a starting point that since Columbine, what do you what would you say have been the biggest strides in prevention? like say in the threat assessment field, the world, and, and what are the biggest strides that we've made in our community about that interview, intervention, response skills, or tactics? What would you say about that? I think that I'm very comfortable that law enforcement knows what to do in response now. We're in Columbine, you know, they, even though they knew a lot about how to respond, they had so many things they didn't know how to overcome, like radio communications between SWAT teams and things like that. All of that is on the wayside now. And absent, you know, a particular incident, law enforcement knows that their job is to go to the shooter. And they're so determined to do that now, no matter what the holdups are, no matter what the challenges are. I love that that since Columbine is there. There's also this, because of Columbine and afterwards, this massive community of people who have been through it before, who are supporting. There's a Frank DeAngelis, who is the Columbine Principal High School I mentioned right. before, created the Principal Network. And it is a network of principals who call out and reach out to support other uh, mm. school officials when they have a shooting occur. There are police chiefs doing the same thing. Yeah. People are, are reaching out who've, who've experienced before. So I love that in terms of recovery and response. But I also love the at the moment of that, even though there are some different versions that some people use, I love that now, nowadays, it's I remember the first time somebody came into my office with a printed email and said, look at this, this university tweeted out run, hide, fight. And we thought that was amazing because we didn't think that we could ever get the traction to make run, hide, fight a national messaging. And that run, hide, fight is a national messaging. In the UK, they use run, hide, tell. But the concept is the idea of these are three verbs. And now, even though it's taught kind of in different ways, and sometimes people use different words, everybody knows that so many people. And even though there are adults, I'll say this one other thing, even though there are more adults who are like, we're dragging into the 20th century, as we used to say, <laughs> trying to convince them that it's okay to say run, hide, fight. And they're like, oh, you can't talk about fighting. That's scary for kids. Kids are getting it. Kids are all saying run, hide, fight. They're tweeting run, hide, fight to each other. And so the generations since Columbine have grown up with this and they're not nearly as afraid of it as the adults are around them. And yeah. so the adults will pass on and the people who are worried about scaring people, that's not happening. But the one other thing I wanted to just add, as you mentioned, asked about threat assessment. I just really struggle with, I'm an ATAP member, but I'm not the threat assessment professional, obviously, that the rest of you are. I just play one on TV and I feel like we're just really still struggling because people don't understand and how, know how to engage in that. We, yeah. we talk about it in our podcast some but not nearly as much as we should. So I guess you guys should be on our podcast. <laughs> well, and 
Scott, I mean, you do more of this and get more of these phone calls that I certainly do. But my view is that maybe some like companies, you know, your Netflix, your Apple, your YouTube, they get it. And it's like, because there's money at stake, <laughs> they kind of have those things in place. I don't know if, and maybe there's just too many schools and it's money or what have you, but I feel like that's where it still needs to be trickled down of having a threat assessment team and what that even means. But or just know, a Scott. protocol. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the my encounters with the schools in Southern California are just across this wide spectrum. You'll walk into a school and they've got it down. You know, you're talking to the principal, the, the assistant principal, and they've got just A, B, C, D, E. They've got everything in place, which is so like, oh, great, I could take a breath. And then I'll get another referral, a case I have to go look at with my detective partner. And we walk in and there's nothing in place, mm. like literally nothing closed off affect because they don't want to even admit that they don't have anything. Right. And, you know, it's also jarring that after all this time and after everything that's happened in the last decade, that there are still educational institutions that don't have a plan. Yeah. So, but I, one thing I do love because our, our location is a training site and we have law enforcement come and go through our training every month. We have people from around the world. And one of the things that I see that's amazing is that even like when we have law enforcement come from these rural areas, all the skills are there. All the instincts are there. It's just about imparting to these individuals a new paradigm, a new thought process to use all of that information that already exists. And, and I'm going to be handing out copies of your book. To, <laughs> to all of them because I think we'll sell them to you at a discount. Great. Okay. <laughs> right. We'll sell it. We'll buy it in bulk. But Sarah, I did want to ask you, what does it mean to the mission of education to bring a topic like this to the fans of true crime? And there are a lot of us out here. There are a lot of fans. This is this is a genre that every time we think, okay, it's on its last legs, it finds a new way of emerging into the zeitgeist. So Tell me about that. Like, what does it mean to have this mission for you? Such a good question. I think there's been such an evolution in true crime, the genre anyway, hasn't it? Like, you know, yeah. when you look back at some of the early uh, podcasts. It was pretty gory. It was so gory. And yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I found myself in the space that I was because, you know, sometimes back in the day, and we it's quite a new genre in terms of, you know, you think 2015 serial came out and then there was a sort of explosion of, true crime. And I would just be hungry for putting it in and listening. And then I just found myself like, you know, walking the dog or something, just going, oh my God, this is just, just jarring and horrific. And you, 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 uh, what is the purpose of this? Mm. And I think there's been definitely an evolution in terms of what the purpose is. And I mean, my podcast company that I have now is my tagline is community podcast. It, it's podcast with purpose. Because mm -hmm. if there's no educational value to it, I just really don't. It's just not who I am. And I think it's really strong in the crime con as well. Is yeah. That that has a safe space for that particular kind of true crime genre where it's all about lifting the voices of of the victim's stories and, and those experts that can tell it in a respectful and useful and unscary way. So what are all the things you guys are going to be doing at Crime Con? Sarah? Well, I will be jazz handing it on the creator's corner. Yeah, a little, oh, here comes <laughs> oh, let me tell you about me. So that'll be fun. And I just love that. It's so nice to get to connect with actual people who spend mm -hmm. the time with me in their ears. God bless their little cotton socks. I, <laughs> I'll send them straight to the psychologist afterwards. So you might get them. <laughs> there next. you go. Maybe we can get um, boots next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good, actually. It's it's a great experience, but it is it is a lot of stimulation. I mean, it's like at the right? end of the weekend, we were fried. We were really fried yeah. because because people want to come to you, and that we there are so many stories. There are so many types of people that that present at these yes. conventions. That you know, and because I'm I'm a clinician, I was trained at the master's level as a clinician at the psych at the doctoral level as a clinician, and I just get pulled into these stories. And you realize that this, there's a I'm glad we're moving away from the goriness of it. And we're moving yeah. towards the tr victim centric rather than glorification of perpetrators. And you realize that there's a lot of people out there that are traumatized. And this is a way I think of them being able to process their trauma. And we're all a part of that. I, I, I take that responsibility 
quite heavily. I did want to say one thing. I wanted to share a quote, and I'm going to do my best impersonation of Catherine because this comes from your book. And I think it is, again, we, we touched on it earlier, but it's so very important. Stop looking for a single answer. I'm going to quote you. Equally fatal to the effort to stop active shooters and other targeted violence is a focus on a single solution. We are the meme, post-it, soundbite kind of world right now, and messages must fit into 280 characters. Not helping is the persistent view that there must be a single solution, such as take away the guns, arm teachers, security at houses of worship, and find more good guys with guns. I just hmm. thank you for laying that out there. And I wish that that could be in, I wish that that could be engraved on the doorway to schools <laughs> right now, instead of some other thematic things that are problematic and popping up right now. But I, and I'm going to say that I think your book should be required reading for anybody in threat assessment, because your paradigm clearly generalizes to the larger areas of crime that we all need a better understanding of. So thank oh, you. Thank you. That's so kind of you to say, thank you so much. I mean, it's really written from the heart. When you live around sadness as an agent, you know, you want to empower people and make people feel hopeful. And, and that's my goal. That's our goal in the podcast. And Catherine, you'll be doing a book signing at CrimeCon London? I will be doing, I'll be, I'll be signing both books. I think if we can get the second one there, it just came out. So we're trying to get it there, but I'll be signing both books and I'm going to be doing a speech also. I've Great. got a, I'm going to be doing a platform speech talking about the, the name of the talk is mass shootings in America. What's that all about? Awesome. Sounds fun. <laughs> and we're doing a live show as well, aren't we? We're and doing a live show. USA, oh, USA. Do <laughs> okay, so you're doing. And we're going to do a live podcast from there. So oh, it's nice. going to be a crazy day. It's. I think we're on. I think all of that is on Sunday. Oh, it, okay. Oh, wow. Maybe be, is it? Is it Saturday? I don't know. Uh, we're going to tone down Saturday night then. Yeah. Um, oh, my goodness. Busy Sunday. Well, please Friday night we are going to be doing just a yeah. casual meetup at night. night. I'm sorry. Friday, Friday night, night, June 9th. At Bike yeah. Shed. Yeah, at Bike Shed London, six o'clock. Oh. Okay. Um, wow. Hang out. We're kind Great. of hosting that, co hosting that with Justin and Aaron from Generation Y podcast. But yeah, our, our talk is going to be on Saturday night. We're doing a presentation on incels. So we're going to oh, be good. talking about the latest research and some case studies and the psychological aspects behind it. But where can our audience find you guys, either together or separately, books, websites, social, give us everything? Mine is easy. Mine is katherineschweit.com, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-S-C-H-W-E-I-T, katherineschweit.com, and it links to everything. One-stop shop. Love it. One-stop shop. Sarah, Sarah, what about you? Well, you can tell she's got a social media person who actually thought about that because mine's right. not quite so easy. So, well, I, the best way to get to me is an Instagram and it is the production company. So it's at con, C-O-N, the Nigel Community Podcast. Simple as that, con Community Podcast. Perfect. Well, we will link all that here for our folks. And Thank you. We're so grateful for your time and for the conversation. I feel like our audience can't get enough on this topic, which again, I think just lends to easing some fears, increasing some hope and doing that with facts. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. And for as little as the price of a latte a month, you can be part of the solution to stop the killing. Patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes, autographed books, and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business, school, church, or even just a book club chat. But just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do-gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to community podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. 
Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it because it will happen and it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it.